Well, here we are with our third Sunday um, in our series on liberal evangelism. Uh, don't worry if both those are unfamiliar um, words, and it's probably too churchy a title for St. Bride's. So, how do we share evangelism? E- evangel, it's about good news. And how do we share the good news of being people of faith? in the world today. That's what I'm thinking about. Um, and I need to apologise at the beginning. Somebody will have to stop me at some stage because I think what you're getting is my book, but um, the book isn't written yet. So uh, I'm going to speak it and it might take more than the usual allotted time. So I may just have to stop at some stage. Um, questions about life? Question mark. Have you seen the advert? Anybody seen it recently? Go on, Warren. The, that's right, it's the Alpha Course and it starts every um, September, October in cities around the country and it's great and it helps people to learn something about the basics of Christianity, questions about life. The subtext of course is, well actually, you might have questions about life but we've got some that we really want you to ask. And what's more, we've got the answers too. So, um, thanks for your questions. Now, here's our questions. Oh, and here's the answers. Um, So, that's the way that the church... And that works for some people. And if it works for you, that's great. I'm glad um, that that works for lots of people. It doesn't work for me anymore, but um, it's great for those it works for. But lots of people in society are turned off by that approach these days. And are looking for something a little bit more subtle. Um, John V. Taylor, a famous bishop in the Church of England, was with his son um, listening to a preacher in, I think it was Portsmouth Cathedral, and his son turned to him at the end of the sermon and he said, Dad, all the things that man is saying are true. Hello. The trouble is he's not saying them to anyone. Um, And so often we hear a sermon in church or the church addresses an issue and it's addressing its own agenda and its own way of seeing the world instead of being open to something new and saying something new. Uh, In the beginning um, was the word. Well, and then after the beginning there were lots of words. Lots and lots and lots of words. And some of them were very dull and some of them were very irrelevant. Um, Christianity, so often when it speaks to itself and speaks to the world, is spouting words about, well, what can we say? An immortality cult. It's all about that question there was a big anxious question at the time of the Reformation, what happens when we die? And Christianity has become just about that question. And as Marcus Borg says at the beginning of one of his recent books, if you'd have told me age 10 that Christianity was about anything else, I wouldn't have known what you were on about. Christianity uh, was and is for many people all about that big question of life, what happens when I die? And addressing only that question, Christianity has become pushed into a little corner where those who are particularly interested and feel particularly pushed to get an answer and feel safe with an answer to that question are there with Christianity in that little corner. John Drain uh, is a famous professor of missiology, I think at St Andrews University, uh, was on a visit to Durham Cathedral. Um, He knew folk at Durham Cathedral and he was going to say evening prayer with the chapter and then have a meal with them afterwards. Trouble is he turned up wearing a leather jacket and uh, his way was barred by uh, one of the well-meaning cathedral officials. You can't come in they're about to start and the it's um, what's in the mind of the cathedral verger or whoever it was that what they were doing 
is so different to what we do on earth in our everyday lives that somebody in their 40s wearing a leather jacket couldn't possibly be interested, it couldn't possibly be relevant to them. So that immortality cult and those questions and propositions addressed to a very few people. I'm sorry, I don't like starting off with a negative, but I am. There we are. Because I think evangelism is so often about that question and that set of interests, particular interests in Christianity. And so it stops us asking the real questions and addressing the real issues. A story I've probably told before um, is about Liam. Liam uh, was somebody I got to know when I first came to Liverpool and was a community worker with those who were homeless or vulnerably housed um, at the Whitechapel Centre in um, Everton where Sarah has just finished her work. And um, being in that category of people is a very high risk way to be. Lots of people on the streets or lots of people who are vulnerably housed um, die and you know as we know uh, for rough sleepers in cities in Western Europe the lifespan is actually a developing world lifespan not the lifespan the rest of us have and Liam died in uh, a fire in his bedsit. Uh, The funeral had lots of people from the Whitechapel Centre there and friends of Liam. Liam was very popular. He'd had a hard life, um, but enormous character, full of fun, full of life, and uh, we were there (coughs) to to grieve, but also to remember the person uh, who we loved. But of course, the vicar who was taking the service didn't know any of that and uh, what he had in front of him and what was in front of us was a box with a body in that was effectively his illustration in a talk on salvation. So Liam, nothing was said about Liam or his life and I know doing the job I do that even if you haven't been briefed before you can chat with people before or even during the service and bring things out about somebody's life. Liam was there to remind us of our mortality of how death can come to us all and so what decision are we going to make? It's one way of looking at people, one way of looking at life, but for me uh, it's become a less and less wholly adequate version. And uh, one of the books that I loved in my early Christian journey was Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And I'm sure, you know, lots of us know the book well. There's a point I remember in the book. where C.S. Lewis is talking about an encounter he's had, because he did lots of public speaking, uh, lots of talks, especially during the Second World War, uh, lots of talks to groups of service people about Christianity um, and about his, his view. And arguably, Lewis did a, a brilliant job of what they called, and is still sometimes called, apologetics, trying to argue the rational basis for Christianity in the modern world. Um, Lewis recalls meeting um, an RAF officer who talked about an encounter. He crashed in the desert and uh, he was there alone waiting for some kind of rescue or waiting for something to happen, Um, sitting through a long night and having an intense encounter with the mystery (coughs) of God. And Lewis dismisses this and says, well, of course, the trouble is with that kind of encounter is it goes nowhere. What you need is to get somewhere is to follow a map. And here's my map. More and more, I think, actually, it's the guy in the audience who was right and Lewis who was wrong. I'm not sure if we do need to follow um, a given map. And maybe the uh, poem that Marguerite read to us, uh, Sidney Carter's poem, uh, Where Are You Going Next? I do not know. I ask the question too all day long. I travel the mystery. Perhaps it's much more wonderful to be on a journey 
to uh, an unknown destination and in an unknown way. So rather than the immortality cult, the answers to questions about life and death, A, B, C and D, the exam which we pass or fail at the end of life, perhaps it's much less like a set of propositions and much less like an exam. And of course that then changes the whole way we do this thing which in technical language we call evangelism because sharing the good news ceases to become about convincing people that those are the right questions to answer, ask and then convincing people that we've got the right answers to them and much more about journeying together in and into the mystery. No wonder to an anxious church trying to still work with those questions and those answers, the most popular book of the last 10 years has been The Purpose Driven Church. And uh, I was musing with a friend the other night, perhaps somebody needs to write a book, The Purposeless Non-Driven Church. So if it's not about believing the right things in order to get to heaven when you die, and not an exam, well, what is it? Um, Conrad Noel, um, some of you may know, I'm looking at Jonathan, um, anybody, uh, does anybody know the name Conrad Noel? Uh, not a, a household name these days, and probably not even in the church, the Red Vicar of Thaxted. Um, Conrad Noel uh, used to talk about glory for me, salvationism. And he was talking about the same thing that I'm talking about in a sense. There's something about Christianity and the teaching of Jesus that putting us and our ultimate des personal destiny at the middle of it, actually, does that really tie up with the self-giving one? I think I want to argue with others who've spoken in this slot over the last couple of weeks um, that Christianity might be far less like a set of propositions to be believed in and far more like a way. And of course that is the name that was given to the first followers of Jesus. Far less than a set of propositions to believe in than a community, a set of joyful relationships and far less than a set of rules and more like a being with. So what might evangelism look like? What might sharing that kind of good news look like? Well, the provisionality and the uncertainty that's expressed in the Sidney Carter poem, uh, I think, gets to it because my contention is, is it's going to look different everywhere in every circumstance and in every community. It's going to look constantly different. And that's harder to package and harder to market, but I think it's more real. <coughs> Conrad Noel um, was a late, well, began in the late Victorian era as what they called a slum priest, ritualist in the East End of London and St Andrew's Plasto is where he ministered for many years and for anyone who knows the East End you'll laugh at that because St Andrew's now is um, it, it, certainly not Conrad Knowles theology um, but um, he was part of a group of um, highly intellectual, highly motivated priests who took the Anglo-Catholic ritual into the East End and into the slum cities around this country. And what they offered was, in the worship, a little taste of heaven, something that was, uh, well, very ritualised, very beautiful, very stylised. And the idea was, this is, we are offering absolutely the best that could possibly be offered for the most ordinary people. But with that went a massive social concern, massive engagement with programmes of provision for the poorest. Noel was um, 
encouraged to leave the East End and I, I don't know, I've never got to the bottom of what made him make the switch, but he had um, uh, a, a patron, um, Lady Warwick, and she was also patron of the living of Thaxted in Essex, and Noel went to Thaxted, uh, I think, in 1910. And what he found there was a church that was like most English village churches, most English small town rural churches, a church which was all about the establishment. The Union Jack flew in the chancel and um, it was the church where the local lord and lady came. Um, I think there would have still been rented pews in 1910. I think we still had them here in 1910. Um, there, uh, there would have been very strict social segregation. The wealthy would have gone to the morning service and their servants and the field workers in the fields would have gone to the evening service. Um, and the church was all about everybody uh, knowing their place, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. And the Church of England reflected that very much. Noel turned all that on, he, on its head. Um, and he saw that the gospel of personal salvation and all kind of got in the way of that, um, uh, of, of um, a new way of seeing things. And what he did was not just to transport the, um, uh, the slum priest stuff from the East End, but actually to discover something entirely new. What was also coming in um, 1910 um, was uh, mechanisation and the beginning of the end of, um, if you like, farming as an activity of the masses. And more and more machines were being brought into the fields and so what was being lost, uh, as is always lost um, when there are big industrial changes, was a whole culture. So Noel saw a folk song culture, a folk dance culture, a story culture disappearing before his eyes. And what he did was to say, hang on, we need to look at what's being lost here. These are the people's stories, the people's songs, the people's dances, and he brought them into church. Um, it helped that his organist was Gustav Holst. Um, Holst went out with others at the time, Vaughan Williams and others, they went out into the time and with the great collectors of folk songs, they listened to the songs and they wrote down the tunes and they brought them into church. And so instead, instead of the uh, tunes which had been sung in Thaxted Church, new tunes arrived. And these were the songs of the people, the, the songs that people recognised from the fields. And um, I think even in our hymn book, there is a hymn tune called Thaxted. And uh, if you've been around in the Church of England much, you'll have been into a church, usually an Anglo-Catholic church, which has a green hymn book. And that's the English hymnal. And that's essentially the book that um, Holst and Vaughan Williams and others put together on the back of bringing all of these tunes back into church. And besides the songs, there was Morris dancing and all sorts of rural traditions. And what Noel said is that your traditions are an expression of the divine, of the God given in your midst. And we bring them into church and we celebrate them in the context of the Christian story. Now, Noel also had a very hard political edge and he flew a red flag in the chancel and there are great stories of how students, evangelical students from Cambridge would go and tear down, ritually tear down the red flag from the chancel in Thaxted. And um, I'm not sure how well guided Noel was in his sort of national political work because he ended up as a founder of a, a kind of British wing of Trotskyism. But we won't go down that road. But um, in, with, the, with the local what Noel brought was not um, <clears throat> this glory for me salvationism, but 
uh, an intense wave of social and local political activity. So he was involved in organising a strike at a local sweet factory. Um, social activity, political activity, which went together with the people's music, the people's song, the people's dance. <coughs> and that's what evangelism looked like in Thaxted. He listened very closely to what was going on in that society. And rather than giving the answer that he'd been schooled to give in the East End, he gave an entirely new answer that hasn't been seen before and hasn't been seen since. When I arrived in Everton to begin my sort of homeless community work, uh, I used to go to St Peter's Church in West Everton. And the vicar then as now um, is Henry Corbett. Henry probably holds some kind of record for ministry in the Church of England in one parish. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, and what the church was about was the West Everton Housing Cooperative. Um, in the Hatton era, um, a group of 74 bedroom council houses just by the church had been slated for demolition. And the church looked at this and said, whatever we believe in and whatever we stand for as a church, demolishing this big group of houses, which is there for families, and they were perfectly sound houses, being demolished for reasons of tidiness, really. Um, uh, this can't be the right thing. And they occupied the houses. And so the scriptures became, uh, the scriptures they read were scriptures, um, well, Nehemiah, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. They stopped talking about the gospel as out there and something to do with eternal destiny. And the gospel was about these houses, this struggle, and it brought the whole thing to life and started really an explosion of activity around that church, which 30 years on is still resonating. Desmond Tutu often used to quote Gandhi and say, to the hungry person, God can only come as bread. To the hungry person, God can only come as bread. The gospel looks different depending where you are, depending who you are. Um, I'm going to stop myself there with that bit because I've gone on far too long as I threatened to do. <laughs> so, what does, what does Christian faith look like? What do we share? What's our, what does our evangelism look like? Well, it's about being rooted authentically in the place we are with the people we are called to serve. And yes, we've got the book, and we've got the tradition, we've got the history. But we read, uh, John Saxby um, says, what we do is we read the world first. We read the parish first, we read the setting first, and then we go back to the tradition, then we go back to the book, and we see where are the passages, where are the scriptures that really resonate with and talk to this situation. And that's where the life of the Spirit then comes in helping something new to happen. It's not about the given answer that's been there since the Reformation. It's about finding something new which resonates in this place, in this time. And of course, I suppose that's something of what we were trying to do when we did the relaunch at St Brides. We go back to 2007, was it, Jonathan? Uh, November 2007. And we asked very seriously of ourselves, of the community groups who use the church, of our neighbours, um, what kind of church does this community need? What kind of... Um, you know, what, what are we being called to be? So we didn't start with the tradition. We started with the needs of the neighbourhood and these ideas around creating creative, progressive, inclusive church were the answer that fell out at that time. I'd be interested to see if we re-asked the question uh, where that would take us. I'll come back to the funeral. So what do you do? What do you do if the body in the box isn't going to be your illustration in a talk on salvation? 
So what do you say at a funeral? Many clergy have a standard funeral talk. And for reasons of time, that's sometimes needed. Uh, I've got one tucked away and I can give it at the drop of a hat. But really, um, what we should do, what the church does at its best, is first to listen to the story of the person who's died, to listen to the story of the community they were part of, to listen to the family they were part of. What is there in the great riches of this Christian tradition, Judeo-Christian tradition, and all the wisdom accumulated in the 2,000 years since? What is there that speaks uniquely to these people and to this situation? And that's what we do. And to me, it's a much more exciting and a much more authentic way than trying... Because listening in the apologetic mode, in the old mode, is about saying, OK, I'm really going to listen to you, and I'm going to listen out for some way in which what I'm hearing connects with the story I want to tell you. And when I've heard that, I'm going to make the jump. And so often preaching is in that mode. And it's about hearing something. I believe it's about hearing something entirely new that really honours that person in a unique way and perhaps a passage of scripture that's never been used in a funeral. Start where people are, not to lead them to where you want them to be, but to go somewhere new together. Could we have the second poem and then I'll just finish with a little word. It's a long way off, but inside it there are quite different things going on. Festivals of which the poor man is king and the consumptive is healed. Mirrors in which the blind look at themselves and love looks back at them. And <coughs> industry is for mending the bent bones and the minds fractured by life. It's a long way off, but to get there takes no time and admission is free. If you will purge yourself of desire and present yourself with your need only and the simple offering of your faith, green as a leaf. R.S. Thomas's poem, The Kingdom, and what Thomas is writing about is this glorious festival, which is the kingdom of God, which Jesus inaugurated around fires, in alleyways, in marketplaces, in disreputable back streets, with all sorts of people sitting around, talking, sharing, breaking bread. The kingdom of God, as our reading said, is among us. The kingdom of God is among people. And my contention is that real evangelism is about getting close to that kingdom. And when we're close to the kingdom, we're close to God. The closer to the, and the closer the church is to that kingdom, the more attractive it is. We don't need smart words. We don't need to find the right words. We need the authenticity that is the kingdom of God. Amen.